Good dear students, um, I welcome you once again to a, another pre-recorded lecture. Uh, this pre-recorded lecture is going to focus on research design and specifically on uh, quantitative research. We've had quite a bit of extensive discussion on quantitative research, especially in the lecture that we had uh, yesterday, the live lecture on Zoom. And uh, this particular uh, discussion will focus on research design and quantitative uh, research. In, a ne in the next video, we shall look at research design and qualitative research. So first, let us begin with design. Now, we shall understand certain things are generic, whether it's quantitative or qualitative research. Certain things are, are generic, for example, what research design is, what it, what it comprises. So let us begin with the basic concept of design. What is design? So essentially, it is planning. Design means we are planning. We're planning for our research. Uh, we have looked at the definition of research and we know that our intention is to do a systematic inquiry using scientific methods to achieve a certain objective or to solve a certain problem. So that requires planning, especially that we want our research to, to be considered as scientific, to produce a scientific result. That this result can be can be accepted because it has gone through the scientific process. So essentially that requires planning on the whole. Now, the design, the, the, the objective of the, 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 the plan, as we see here, the, the objective of the plan is to ensure that we achieve our objective and we achieve it using a scientific method. We also want to avoid wasteful expenditure of money, time, and energy. Anyone who has done research knows how time-consuming it is. The amount of energy it takes, especially uh, time thinking about something, trying to, 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 to pick out the logic in what you're trying to do. So the research design essentially is a blueprint. It's a blueprint that guides you, guides the researcher. And it also guides um, the process of data collection, sampling, and analysis. Okay. So essentially, when we look at the term research design, we are saying we're making a skeleton for our research project. And we are trying to set aside, um, or rather, ensure that we begin uh, making decisions on the what, where, when, how much, and so on and so forth, regarding our inquiry. So what questions would we be looking at? So this particular slide looks at the questions that guide us coming up with our research design. What is the study about? Why are we doing this study? Where will we do this study? What type of data shall we collect? And so on and so forth. You can go through this, this slide independently and, and see the areas, the different questions that are posed. When we look at these questions, they essentially guide um, our entire report. When we are saying what we want to study, we are basically talking about our first chapter. All of these that these questions ask, what we want to study, what aspects of the subject are we studying, what is, what is the significance of study. This is the, essentially the first chapter. When we introduce what we are trying to do, when we, we talk about our research problem, our objectives, our justification, why we want to do this thing. This is the major, these are the major questions that are covered. When we are looking at uh, literature review, we are essentially looking at the question, what prior research has been done? What 
are other researchers saying about the subject area we are looking at? In yesterday's lecture, somebody um, asked a question or gave an example that in, in the field of agriculture, specifically in the, in the institution where he works, um, that there are people who, um, they are scientists who discover new diseases but find no literature about the disease. They may not find literature about the disease, but they can't find literature about the, the crops they do attack and the diseases that are known. And then they begin to report about this new thing. So it's not possible to say there's absolutely no literature about the subject area. The, the, this, the disease that has been discovered exists in a certain context. It exists in a certain context. Um, so there's literature about that context in general. How the study is going to be done. This focuses on methodology. Yeah? This focuses on methodology. Um, what method are we going to use? What data collection methods? What tools are we going to use? And so on and so forth. So this question essentially answers uh, what kind of data are we collecting? What was found? This is when we are reporting back. We are reporting back our results. And we're making conclusions. And all these conclusions point to the objective and the research problem. Okay. So essentially, this, this slide looks at um, the entire process, or rather, the components of your research design. What would you expect? to see in your research design. We first start with the area that is intriguing us, the area where we select our, where we identify and talk about our problem and the nature of our problem. And here, we ref once we do that, we are refining the phenomenon we are intending to study. Once we do that, we determine our research problem and objective. From there, we build a theoretical framework. Our the theoretical framework, where we start our literature review when we are discussing um, where we are coming from, what research has been done. And we also identify the theory, the theory that is going to help us fulfill our research objectives. This theory then helps us identify our hypothesis or define our hypothesis. Now, please note this is, this is when we are, we are not talking about specifically quantitative research when we define a hypothesis. Once we have defined our hypothesis, we develop our operational definitions. Now, operational definitions will have to exist even in a quali qualitative research. This has to exist to, to tell the reader, to, to educate the reader on your subject area uh, so that they know exactly what it is they are, they are, that you are discussing. Now, these operational definitions also include our research variables. Yeah, Those specific elements in your context that you're going to look at. Now, these variables must have also been defined in our hypothesis. We shall have a separate discussion to discuss hypothesis and research questions. We shall have the, that time. Yeah, it's to simply to look at uh, research design. We then define our sampling design. Yeah, this is when we decide um, we are going to tackle this problem from this uh, with this sample size, this with this within this context, with this number of people, and in, in, who are who exist in this specific context. So this is where the sampling part comes in. We define our data collection methods and tools. Once we have collected our data, we then begin to code our data and uh, refine it, and then carry out analysis and interpret to see if we 
approve or disprove our hypothesis. Finally, we add on to existing theory. Now, it is from this research, from what you report, that somebody else will then produce, find, or identify another area which can add on to your own research. So the research becomes a cycle. The research doesn't end with, doesn't end with you, but you, you report back and others then pick out uh, new areas of research. Now, in defining that blueprint, that roadmap to guide our research, a major thing we are trying to do is, for, is trying to ensure validity. Now, yesterday we had a long discussion on validity. Now, and I remember uh, Kripen gave us a, a very good uh, explanation on validity in quality in quantitative research. So here we are simply going to add on to what uh, Kripen shared with us. What we are talking about when we talk about validity is that we are trying to draw accurate conclusions from our research. Remember, this is a scientific inquiry. Anything scientific must produce um, something that all can say, uh, yes, we can rely on this data. We know there are certain, certain information that we can't rely on. For example, um, gossip. If I came and told you, oh, I had a Kripen, uh, Kripen went and stole something from, from institution XYZ. That is gossip. I, have, I haven't seen Kripen do this. I haven't, I'm not in that institution. So that is basically gossip. So it can't be relied upon. There are times somebody can give information and this information cannot be relied upon. It may be true, but you can't necessarily rely upon it. For example, someone can say, oh, the whole of Uganda is infected with COVID. Whereas we have COVID-19, that is true. But if I come and state it, I'm not part of, of the group that is, is going around and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, for example, the National Task Force. I'm not part of it. I'm not part of even the district task force. So how would I know that the whole of Uganda is infected with COVID? I don't know. Um, so it would be erroneous for me to say that. But when we are doing research, our primary intention is that at the end of it, we want that we, the conclusions we draw are accurate. That is a key point. So we do this by carrying out, first of all, internal validity and external validity. So we, yesterday we, we actually touched on this subject on internal validity. And here we start with the variables that we are dealing with, ensuring that the relationship with the variables we have selected can, can actually be examined. that these variables can actually be, we, we, we carefully and scientifically uh, ensure that the variables we're examining are appropriate, that the tools we are trying to examine, that the tools we are using are actually addressed to the variables we want to examine. Yesterday, Kripen gave us a very good discussion on this, but we shall discuss it a bit later. He gave us a very good discussion on how to uh, validate our tools, for example, our questionnaires. He gave us uh, several uh, strategies that are used. We have then external validity. This is when we say, well, can we relate our research to, um, to elsewhere, to, to another population which is not part of our research? Is it possible for us to generalize our findings to outside of our research context? So how do we achieve both internal and external validity? So we do that by at three levels. The first we refer to as systematic variance. The next is confounding variance, and the last is uh, error uh, error variance. How do we do this? We start with what is referred to as the Max Max Micon principle. Now this principle begins with maximizing 
systematic variance, minimizing error, and controlling variance of nuance or um, confounding variables. Let's go through it one at a time. Let's start with maximizing systematic variance. This considers widening the range of values of uh, the range of values of research variables. What do we mean? Let us say we are doing an experiment. And uh, when we're talking at variables in quantitative research, we always have an independent variable and a dependent variable. We want to ensure that, that the two actually have a causal relationship. So in an experiment, one of the advantages of an experiment is that you can control the conditions. What do I mean? If a researcher is trying to determine if a certain drug can fight a certain disease, within an experiment, especially a lab experiment, the researcher can go ahead and determine that you have this disease with no other variables, with no other controlling variables. Can this medication or can this particular drug treat this particular virus or bacteria or whatever it is can it do that and within a controlled experiment for example in a lab a researcher a scientist can try to determine that relationship if this drug can treat this this disease that is a highly controlled environment you can also do that in the field of IS, and specifically in IS, where we can try to determine if a certain system or application is able to carry out a, a, a certain functionality. So that can be done in an experiment where we try to determine if certain functionality is achievable in a controlled environment. We can determine if the system is able to handle, for example, a wrong data input and that it behaves appropriately. We can do that in an experiment. Okay? Now, we can also then do that in non-experimental studies. We can also achieve systematic variance where we determine we, we, we in, in, in a non-experimental study what essentially we are saying we are examining certain variables within their natural environment so unlike the experimental lab where you can control the conditions outside of the lab in the in a natural environment you cannot control for example, if we are looking at the same experiment, okay, the same experiment of a drug with a disease, it is possible to, to determine if an independent variable, hmm, the, 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 the drug, I hope I'm not mistaking the two, the drug and then the independent and independent, if the drug can actually have an effect on the disease or the bacteria or the, the virus. Let's say the bacterial virus. If it can actually have an effect in, the, in, in a natural environment. Now, the thing about a natural environment is that there are other things that are at play. Take an example. Um, in the fight against COVID, there are certain drugs that are recommended. Um, and, and we've seen them on social media. There are certain drugs that are recommended to help treat COVID, okay? But there are also certain nutrition, nutrition. Uh, uh, there are certain um, rem natural remedies that are also recommended. So let us say, um, let us say that they, are, they, they would say that, oh, yesterday we talked about st certain steroids, which really, really are quite helpful in treating COVID-19. Let us say you have a patient who is treating COVID-19 using these steroids, but at the same time is also using um, 
natural remedies like for example they are steaming they are taking their vitamins they go out early in the morning for vitamin d and so on and so forth they are doing all those things and this patient eventually overcomes covid 19. then one may say okay how sure are you then that it's not the natural remedies that cured the patient but it is um it is this this particular um, uh it, it's not the, the the steroids that have actually treated but what you can do is to select subjects with different backgrounds so that these subjects can help determine take an example you can decide to select two groups one group that is taking both steroids and the vitamin c's and the other natural remedies another group which is only taking the steroids and you see if there is any adverse effect if there's any significant effect on the treating of covid to determine whether this drug this steroid actually does have an impact so you avoid to avoid uh, to avoid a range of restriction you select a sufficient number of subjects from different with with with, with, with different variables at play to ensure that you can you can answer the the the, the you can um, put forth the hypothesis that steroids actually do treat covid now the same thing if we if we bring the same example we can think of the same example in terms of is because we gave it in the experimental example uh, in the ex ex experimental scenario can we do the same thing with let's say with an is uh, artifact or even ICT, ICT also is known for developing artifacts. For example, you can develop a model or a framework or something that and which can be tested as well. You can also think of the same scenario. In a controlled environment, a system may behave in a certain way. For example, um, if, I'm, um, if I'm testing the, 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 the I'm doing rigorous tests on a system, if I am a developer, I can I can put in errors that I that I thought about as I was developing the system. But when you bring it into the natural world, when you bring this system into the natural world and you have, let's say, a, a, the, the use our everyday users. Um, take an example, if you have an application on a phone and uh, if you have, let, let us say I have my phone and uh, on it I have an application which I'm supposed to use as an adult user. Then tomorrow I hand it over to uh, my two-year-old nephew. I hand my phone to my two-year-old nephew and he lands on this application. And he does something that a child, only a child with their imagination and with their um, thinking, uh, maybe enters something they're not supposed to enter. How will this application behave? Will it, is, uh, uh, the, the experimental um side may not the, the the experimental tests may not have answered that side now even those non-experimental studies can focus on that again giving it to this application to different users for example give it to a user as novice as a child as, as young as as um who has limited computer literacy skills as uh, like a child give it to a user with very limited computer literacy skills or you a user with limit or not limited or not training on that particular system and in each case determine how the system behaved with only with those particular mistakes that can exist with a user who is, who is a complete novice maybe in terms of systems in terms of computers and so on and so forth and if you have this wide range of subjects you're able to determine that, uh, uh, that what what the, the relationship between your independent and dependent variables. We come to the third, the third principle, minimizing error variance. Now here we are specifically looking at um, the instruments we are going to use to collect our data. Now on on uh, yesterday uh, Crippen gave us a, a very nice description and explanation so which I'm not going to repeat but I believe is is um, extremely helpful 
when we look at the instruments we are going to use in a quantitative research, instruments like a questionnaire, how well designed they, they are determines the level of, of the, the, minimizes the level of errors that we can receive once we, we um, administer that questionnaire to our subjects. Um, Krippen gave us some of these. Um, giving your questionnaire to, let's say, an expert, okay? Pre-testing your tools. All these things help in minimizing errors and therefore also give us accurate results at the end of the day. So how do we minimize? Uh, increase validity and reliability. Um, measuring variables under ideal conditions. Measuring them in the most ideal conditions as, as much as possible. So uh, when we have, for example, we ensure that our data collection tools are well designed by taking them through the, 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 the stages of, um, of, of, of testing the appropriate stages and we also ensure that we have uh, appropriate su subjects selected appropriate sample size then we can ensure validity and reliability control now here we want to ensure that we do not correct data that is that may be useless to us we had a small discussion with tom last week yesterday when when he asked a question that if if i am trying to see the relationship between customer retention and product uh, product innovation but however there are other variables which can bring about customer retention and we say and in our discussion we say then remove the variables that you don't that you that you know uh, contribute to customer retention but they are not of interest to you remove those variables because what they are going to do is is going to mislead they are going to mislead our results okay remove those things that you know are, are not of use here in this slide we have an example. Let us say we want to determine the relationship between age and blood pressure. And then we bring in hearing problem. Now, these are two completely differing variables. A hearing problem doesn't have any relationship to blood pressure. So it, it would be a good idea for the researcher to cut out this variable and it shouldn't appear in the researchers uh, data collection tools because once that appears it's going to give us completely misleading um, results we want to focus on age and blood pressure what is the relationship between the two okay How would we control these confounding variables? One, if it's an experimental uh, setting, go back to uh, where we talked about maximizing. If it's a, an experimental research allows us to create a controlled environment where you look at the two variables and if, if there is any effect. In a survey or non-experimental, we only include subjects that are appropriate with appropriate characteristics. Only subjects with appropriate characteristics. Here in the slide, we give an example of male university students. If we wanted to determine uh, if gender affects, let's say, performance, if we know that the, 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 there is a that gender affects performance, then we may not want to look at both male and female. We may not want to look at, we may want to cut out 
the female uh, the female students to so that we don't we don't uh, we don't bring in the effects of gender okay we may want to cut those out so now briefly um, just to have a recap and to summarize what we've discussed ensure that you have adequate range of values or variables in your research ensure that you have an adequate range of variables and subjects it is important that we have precise and accurate measurements identify and control if things that are going to affect your uh, your, your your results have a control on that. We, I gave you the example, in, for example, in IS, if let's say we are testing uh, the robustness of this, of a system or an application. In a natural environment, we want to ensure that we pick out all those things that may affect the robustness of a, of, of, um, of a system or an application. If it is the literacy levels of a user, make sure you have test subjects there that have a certain level. If it is um, somebody, a, a novice user who is not meant to access the system and this novice user does access it, how should the system behave or application? How should it behave? I gave you the example of, let us say, my two-year-old nephew accesses my an application on my phone and uh, and his his playfulness comes into contact. How should the system how does the system behave in that sense? Um, so that one ensures that we have all ranges, all variables and all, re all subject areas covered. Appropriate subject selection, triangulation as well, if, it's, if you're looking at uh, mixed method. We shall talk about triangulation in detail when we look at research design in um, a quality a qualitative study. So I thank you for listening. I'm going to put up a discussion forum where we can immediately begin to have a discussion on, on things that or experiences or questions, then we can cover those in our Friday lecture. I thank you.